Grand jury votes to indict Donald Trump in New York. Mr. Trump will be the first former president to face criminal charges. The precise charges are not yet known, but the case is focused on a hush money payment to a porn star during his 2016 presidential campaign. The federal bribery trial of L.A. City Council member Mark Riley Thomas ends in convictions on seven of the 19 charges in the indictment, including convictions on bribery, conspiracy, honest service, mail fraud, and wire fraud. Sentencing to be held on August 14th of this year. Pope Francis was hospitalized yesterday. He's being treated for a respiratory infection. The Vatican says that he's improved overnight. Uh, the Pope has delivered his weekly address earlier and had delivered his weekly address earlier in that day. It's less than two weeks until Easter, one of the busiest times of year for the Pope. The 86-year-old schedule has been cleared through the end of the week. New York Democratic Representative Jamal Bowman yesterday exploded at Kentucky GOP Congressman Thomas Massey over gun violence measures while exiting the House floor. The fiery exchange, which was caught on camera, occurred just two days after a heavily armed assailant entered the Covenant School in Nashville, Tennessee, killing three students and three staff members. The shooter was armed with two assault-style weapons and a handgun. Reparations for Black Californians could top $800 billion. The preliminary estimate is to compensate Black residents for generations of over-policing, disproportionate incarceration, and housing discrimination. You are listening and watching Ariva Martin in real time, and I'm your host, Ariva Martin. This is your one-stop destination for today's trending news, expert analysis, and my unfiltered opinions. Today has been a busy, busy news day, and mostly around legal news. Not only uh, were we... Uh, finally able to get the verdict in the federal bribery trial of city council member Mark Lee Thomas. That's a case that has captured the entire Los Angeles community in the state of California. The jury was out four and a half days before it came back with that verdict. We have been providing wall-to-wall -wall coverage of that trial. Our uh, Justice Correspondent Dion Raymond has been in that courthouse every day since the trial began. She was there uh, today when the jury came back with the verdict, when the jury exited the courthouse or exited the courtroom. She was able to actually speak with the foreperson of the jury and was able to share with us what the thinking was about that case. And we, we just had an expert legal panel help us understand how this jury got to those seven uh, guilty verdicts. We know that Mark Lee Thomas's team is likely to appeal. Our legal experts say there's lots of things for him to appeal. And also uh, one of our experts pointed out that this is such an unusual case because it's a case about bribery, but there was no money exchanged. At least there was no money given to Mark Ridley Thomas. Uh, there's no private jets, no houses, no expensive suits or jewelry or any of the other kinds of things when you think of uh, federal corruption cases involving elected officials. In this case, it was about what the prosecution said was Mark Riley Thomas's efforts to cover up or to provide, I guess, a safe landing for his son, who was leaving the California state legislature with some allegations of sexual harassment. Prosecution says Mark traded a county contract in exchange for his son to get a job at USC uh, and to get a professorship there. Uh, according to our justice correspondent and so many of the other legal experts following this case, the government put on a very shoddy case, uh, put on a witness in the, the uh, i.e., a FBI agent that gave testimony that was inconsistent, that was so inconsistent that the judge had to issue a jury instruction uh, regarding that testimony. Uh, a lot of reporting in mainstream media has been through the lenses of the prosecution, not many of the mainstream media giving credit to Mark Ridley Thomas and the tremendous work that he has done throughout the city. Uh, and here at KBLA as a black owned radio station, we want to make sure folks understand uh, we respect the jury process. We respect uh, the legal process in this country, but we also understand that 
uh, African Americans, no matter who you are, how much money you make, what your status in life is, uh, we face a different uh, criminal justice system. We face a criminal justice system full of implicit biases, and those implicit biases can oftentimes impact not only how we are charged, uh, but how deliberations go and how cases turn out. Again, when you have an African American defendant, we're going to continue to follow that case, see what happens. Uh, we hope uh, that he fares better on appeal. We hope that this is not the end of the case involving Mark Billy Thomas, but rather the beginning of a process that will allow him to uh, you know, clear his name and regain the uh, some of the reputation, at least, that he has had in this city, uh, given all of the tremendous work that he has done and all of the efforts that he has been engaged in that have improved the lives of literally millions and millions of folks across the county of Los Angeles. Uh, when we come forward, Richard Green is joining us. He's a Democratic strategist, and we've got to talk about this explosive news involving the indictment of Donald J. Trump when we come forward right here on KBLA Talk 1580.
I'm back, and the blockbusting news today, blockbuster news today, is Donald Trump's indictment. Richard Green, Democratic strategist, is here to help us make sense of this news. Hello, Richard, and thank you for joining. Boy, folks said this could not be done, that it would never be done, that Teflon Don would continue to defy the odds, no matter how many uh, investigatory bodies tried to investigate him. There would not be a grand jury in this country that would vote to indict him. So all of those folks have egg on their face today because today Donald Trump was indicted. Tell me your initial reaction. Uh, <clears throat> ecstasy, celebration, jumping up and down. As my 93-year-old mother said, you know, justice is being done yet. Um, so it's it was critical, and I actually spent the last hour watching Fox News Channel, and that's unbelievably sobering. I mean, literally every single person on Fox News Channel thinks this is the end of America. It's a desperately horrible thing. These horrible Democrats, you know, he just had sex with a porn star, big deal. He shouldn't go to jail over that. Anyway, but here's the sobering, the real sobering thought. In order to get a grand jury to agree to indict someone, only takes a majority, generally 12 out of 23. And it's only based upon, you know, is there, you know, it, 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 it's not the same standard as beyond a reasonable doubt. And so to get from indictment to a unanimous jury saying that beyond a reasonable doubt, Donald Trump should go to jail, it's going to be very tricky. So I just want to temper people's expectations. Let's celebrate now. But I have more hope for the other three indictments. So Richard is a recovering lawyer. That's why he knows so much about grand juries and indictments. He's not just pulling this out of thin air. He knows because he's a lawyer himself. But Richard, I do want to say, let's not worry about the trial and the reasonable doubt standard. We'll get to that today in this moment. We have to recognize the significance of this both in a positive way, positively, because it says no one is above the law. But in a negative way, what it says about our country, that we, we, not you and I, but that 70 million people voted for Donald Trump when there was so much, you know, stuff swirling around him at the time that suggested that we would end up here if there were prosecutors who had the guts to ever move forward with an investigation and present a case to a grand jury. So... There should not be, you know, surprised by anyone because even when people were voting for him, they did so knowing that this guy had a shady history, that he had been investigated, uh, or at least there was talks of investigations before. I'm not, I don't want to say on a record that he was investigated, but there was always chaos and issues around Donald Trump. So what do you make of this, Richard? Because we shouldn't feel good as a nation that this is the guy that we elected in 2016. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, but that ship sailed a long time ago, right? I mean, the fact Well, that maybe he, because there's some people already lining up to vote for him again, so not no, necessarily. No, I'm saying that ship about being embarrassed about our country politically, that, that's been out at sea for a long time. I mean, he, he, he got three million less votes than one of the most qualified presidential candidates ever in 2016. He lost 2020 by 42,900 votes, if you look at the Electoral College. Um, the, the bottom line on this is that Donald Trump, and I've said this many times on your show, as a communication strategist, is without a doubt, the most corrupt, disgusting, amoral, unethical man, certainly I have ever seen in public life, but he's also the most talented marketer, charlatan, con man that I think perhaps has ever lived. I mean, the fact that he's turning this into donations to his campaign, into increased martyrdom, and he has people saying on the same day that he is indicted as the first ever former president to be indicted, 
that this now seals his primary victory in the Republican presidential primary. I mean, but to your point, yes, our country is bat, you know what, crazy. And there are people who are so under his cult leadership that I don't think anything, nothing, literally. But the man told us, Ariva, he told us before all this started, he said, you know, when, when someone shows you who they are, right, believe them, all of them, when someone says who they are, believe that he could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and, you know, he wouldn't lose any votes. And he's proving that. So in a way, man, he is a truth teller in a very bizarre way. <laughs> yeah, you're right about a lot of things. Let's unpack what you said. You are right about this. Republicans, not just Donald Trump, Republicans are fundraising on this indictment. They see this as a bonanza, as an opportunity to, you know, rally the base, to galvanize the base, to say, look, we're under attack. We need more money. We need more money to fight these extremist Democrats. And this is how far they'll go. Look, they've indicted your hero. They've indicted the only true leader of this country. Send money now. So lots of grandmothers and grandfathers and people on Social Security and fixed incomes are digging in their pockets. And now they're sending $10, $20, $50 to Donald Trump and to the Republican Party. That makes this all the more gross is that on a day that those Republicans should be, you know, at least saying, what the hell did I do to put this man in office? They're digging deep in their pockets to write him a check. But here's a one little piece of good news, Rich. I don't know if you saw it in the New York Times. Some of the former Trump employees are quietly celebrating, as I suspect some on Fox News are doing too, because we know what they say to the public on TV is not what they say in their private text messages. We've learned that. So we should probably uh, expect they are also texting saying, way to go, uh, DA, Manhattan DA, Alvin Bragg, finally. Uh, that is has to be a part of what some of these folks are saying because we know Donald Trump has stepped on everybody. Anybody in his pathway, he steps on. His loyalty is zero. I would suspect Michael Cohen is somewhere doing a serious happy dance. Uh, but let's talk about what's next. He's been indicted. Tell us, you know, lawyer Richard, tell us what's going to happen next. Well, I have a couple of things. First of all, I just want to remind people that the party that is fundraising around Donald Trump, that is coming to his aid and comfort and, and being so upset about him being indicted, is the same party that is refusing to do anything about the epidemic of gun violence in this country. And 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 they just passed HR one, which is going to destroy the environment and give even more corporate subsidies to oil companies. I mean, honestly, I, I, the Republican Party, if if a screenwriter went into a, a a Netflix or whatever with a with a fictional account of a political party, that was exactly what the Republican Party is today. It would be thrown out as being just even more unrealistic than the Marvel comic book series. But here's the other thing I want to say is I am a little bit disappointed that we got the indictment today. What I thought as a communication strategist should have been done is for all of these indictments to be announced in this at the same time, all four of the potential indictments all come out on the same day or the same week to literally have this tsunami effect so that the people on Fox couldn't say, well, it's just about a porn star and an accounting error on the bookkeeping, you know? So that was, I think, a mistake. But what's going to happen is- But Donald wait a minute, Trump but wait a minute, Richard. That's only the narrative of the GOP and the MAGA base. We know this is not just about a porn star. This is about interfering with the 2016 election. We know this was about suppressing a story that perhaps had it come out would have caused Donald Trump to lose that election. So we can't let Republicans turn this into a story that's just about a porn star because it's not that at all. This is a this is as significant as the Georgia interference in the 2020 uh, election. That investigation in my book, they're on par with oh. each other because he interfered with 2016. And but for that, perhaps Hillary Clinton would have been the president in 2016. 
No, 100%. We talked about this last time, but the we that you're talking about, Ariva, are the really smart people that watch and listen to your show. The but that's, we, that's our job, Richard. You're a strategist. We got to make sure that Democrats get this. We got to make sure that this message is, is said messaging over and is over, not and our, over again. Messaging is not our strong point. Uh, you know, we've talked about that many we, times. We can get better. Th this should energize our messaging. <laughs> this should energize us. No, Let's I talk about what's going to happen because there's a new report out there Tuesday. Big day, Tuesday. He's going to turn himself in and be arraigned. So a former president, Richard, is going to walk into a courthouse. This has to be coordinated with Secret Service. This is no Joe off the street. He is Joe off the street. He's worse than Joe off the street, but he's got a lot of folks that, you know, uh, follow him around to protect him because he has secrets about the country that are important to preserve. So hes they've got to coordinate with Secret Service. He's got to get walked into a courthouse. Tell us how humiliating that's going to be, even though we know what all the bravado, he's going to act like it's nothing. But that could not be fun for Donald Trump. Well, it's going to be two completely parallel and disconnected universes. <clears throat> TikTok is going to probably have the picture, if we can get the picture of him, you know, being handcuffed or fingerprinted or, or the, the mugshot. That's going to get a billion views in 30 minutes. But he's probably going to raise more money off of those photos in, tw in one hour than he's raised in a year. I mean, this is martyr, the Super Bowl of martyrdom from him. And I, again, I, I'm excited about it. I think it's the right thing to do. I'm really banking on the other three indictments. You know, what happened in Georgia, right? The, the documents, the classified documents scandal at Mar-a-Lago. And oh, by the way, January 6th, right? I mean, all four of those need to come together and be talked about in terms of who this man is and why he deserves to have justice. But one thing I would disagree, I would say that the Stormy Daniels situation is way worse than what happened in Georgia because what happened in Georgia was a phone call, an ineffective phone call after the fact of the 2020 election. The Stormy Daniels hiding of that did, I believe, totally changed the election. He law he won the 2016 election, Ariva, as you know, by 78,000 votes in divided amongst three states. And I am certain that there would have been more than 78,000 people who would have been so disgusted, especially mm. these Christians, so disgusted <laughs> by that, that they would have stayed home or voted even for Hillary. Now, the question is, and I agree with you 100%, the next question is, he goes into this courthouse on Tuesday, he gets arraigned, he's got to get fingerprinted, he's got to have his mugshot taken, and you're right, that picture's going to go out and they're going to make a lot of money on that, they're going to fundraise. But at some point, there's got to be a trial schedule, and he's running for president, and there's nothing in our Constitution that prohibits someone who's been indicted from running for president. So he doesn't have to suspend his presidential campaign. He doesn't have to suspend his rallies or anything. But what do you think will happen as a practical matter, Richard, as it relates to his presidential run for 2024? Um, I think it only helps him. Another, he has been all about grievance and martyrdom and how he, he the guy who was given, what, $100 million by his dad, how he's had such a tough life and he's been treated so unfairly. He's going to continue to play that song. He's going to fundraise on it. He's going to emotionally strengthen his connection to his hardcore base. I'm sure Ron DeSantis is not happy about this. I think this does help him in his primary um, election. And we have to remember, an indictment is not a conviction. You are innocent until proven guilty, not innocent until indicted. Absolutely. And there has to be a trial. And as you said, a trial standard beyond reasonable doubt is a much higher bar to cross uh, than the uh, threshold cause. for uh, an indictment, and there's a joke amongst us lawyers that, you know, a good prosecutor can indict a ham sandwich. So we know that. But still, we're talking about a former president of the United States of America. We are not talking about an everyday citizen. We are not talking even about, you know, a celebrity or someone else that may have fame or fortune. This is a unique position that only so many people ever in life will <clears throat> hold. Uh, I don't know, 44, 45 of them in the existence of our country. So we're talking about a very, very small and elite club. Uh, let's talk about, you know, uh, Joe Biden. Talk about message. Richard, 
couple of minutes. What does Joe Biden, who's presumably running for president in 2024, what does he say about this indictment, if nothing. anything? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. He just says, you know, we have three separate and equal branches of government. This is the judiciary. Um, we're going to leave it up to the good people of New York, his the peers, you know, a jury of your peers to decide the future on this case. And I have no further comment. Boom. That's All what right. he has to say. My smart producer reminded me there are 46 presidents to date. Thank you. Not 45. Not well, there were 45 <laughs> previous ones. Yes. But yes, I stand 45 by previous my... Ones. So here are my predictions. You always ask me for my predictions. Um, he will not be convicted, not on this count. Um, and will he I be am, indicted on some of the other investigations? I believe he will be indicted on at least one or two or maybe all three of the other ones, but he still will not be convicted. The difference between getting majority on probable cause as opposed to a unanimous jury beyond a reasonable doubt is huge. All you need is one Trump loyalist on any of these juries and he doesn't get convicted. But I do believe and I hope he will be the Republican nominee because I think this will weaken him amongst rational, sane human beings who hopefully then will get out and vote for whoever is running against him because he cannot be the next president of the United States. This man cannot be the next president of the United States. On that note, thank you, Richard. Always, uh, your brilliance is always appreciated on this show. You uh, have all the best insights. Again, we're going to watch this very closely. When we come Thanks, forward, Arima. two brilliant law students talk about uh, this uproar at Columbia over an Instagram post of Federalist Law students visiting Justice Brett Kavanaugh. Stay with us, KBLA Talk 1580.
I'm back and I'm talking to two Columbia law students about this uh, kind of a firestorm that erupted at the law school over the posting of a picture. Some students who are members of the Federalist Society, uh, pictures that they took with Justice Kavanaugh. Now, this is happening at the nation's top law schools, and this is kind of the latest battleground for politics and free speech on campus. Just a couple of weeks ago, Stanford Law School students shouted down Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals Judge Kyle Duncan. Uh, now, Columbia Law School students want to erase the news that some students met with Supreme Court Justice Kavanaugh. Uh, back in February, the Federalist Society went to D.C. and met with the justice. And on March 14th, the school posted a photograph of the meeting on its Instagram account with a brief note that said the students had a chance to engage in conversation and hear about the court's deliberation process and how to be an effective advocate. Joining me is Goddard Solomon. He's the VP of the Latinx Law Students Association and Erica Lopez. She is president of the Empowering Women Empowering, uh, Empowering Women organization at the law school. Thanks, Goddard, and thanks, Erica, for joining me. I want to start with you, Goddard. What caused students to have such a visceral and negative response to the posting of this photograph with some Federalist uh, members from the law school and Justice Kavanaugh? Yeah, you know, hi, Ms. Martin. Thank you. Know, thank you for having us today. I think it was a couple things that really had students upset. I think one of the first things was that it was a platform being used by Columbia Law School to promote this. So it was really a school-wide promotion of this photo. And it was an individual who, just by being posted on that Instagram, was very triggering to a lot of people in our community, not just people of color and minorities and marginalized individuals who are going to be impacted by the decisions that this justice is writing, but also, you know, victims of sexual assault, sexual abuse, who are just triggered by that content. And so it was harmful in that sense. And I think that's why a lot of students felt very strongly about it. Um, I think another thing is that I think there was so many other things that could have been posted to promote so many other amazing things that the university is doing and students at the law school are doing, but that wasn't done. You know, there were students across the world doing pro bono work and human rights work, and that was not posted on the Instagram. And it's not even an Instagram page that is often used very frequently, but it seemed like a very poorly timed decision to post that, and it was harmful to people, and so people, people were outraged about it. And that was my next question going to be, Erica, how does Columbia Law School use its Instagram page? Does it typically post events that the law students are involved in, whether they take place on campus or off campus? Yeah, so thank you again for having me also. And I'm actually part of the Empowering Women of Color organization, so just wanted to also add that. Um, but I think in general that the Columbia Law School Instagram account, it's not frequently used. Um, it's not the most highly trafficked social media site, I would say. They do tend to post a wide range of activities and events that students participate in. So that's kind of how the administration then justified this post along those lines. But this was actually the most interacted with Instagram post they've ever had. And I think that also speaks volumes to how outraged students were and alumni and prospective students who also are viewing this Instagram account to see this kind of content. So I know, Goddard, that there was a lot of support for the students like yourself and Erica that uh, were in opposition to the posting of the photo, but there's been some uh, media commentary that I've read, folks who have called uh, basically the students spoiled brats, who've said you guys threw a tantrum, that you're trying to quell free speech, and that you're being indoctrinated by the extremist left. <laughs> a lot of those statements are a little ridiculous, but tell me, you know, how do you respond to those folks that say, look, you guys are at one of the most prestigious law schools in the country. It's a bastion of liberalism as, you know, compared to lots of other universities and this is just one photograph of students who are there as well and who have a right to visit a supreme court justice and that this was a lot to do over nothing how do you respond to that 
Yeah, you know, and I think those comments are coming from individuals who are outside the law school and think that this is an isolated in instance where this is the only thing that's ever upset us and now we're up in arms about it just because it's something to do right now. That's really not the case at all. Um, it really is um, the culmination of a lot of things that are really upsetting for um, individuals of color and, you know, marginalized individuals on this campus, you know, dealing with professors who say inappropriate things in class or say use harmful rhetoric in class. That's something we see often, you know, affinity group leaders like myself and Erica, who don't receive much support at all for running these, not even small businesses, essentially, these large organizations on campus that deal with law firms and public public interest entities and, you know, all these other law schools, you know, it's a lot of demanding work and we deal with a lot of lack of support there. Um, and then also, you know, instances on campus where, you know, even students are then, you know, students who have done things that are, you know, insensitive, et cetera. And so this is not an isolated incident where we just decided this was the one that, you know, we're going to really, you know, be upset about. It's a lot of things that culminated in this. And I think the post is really just one final aspect in that. And that's what I think people who are commenting it are missing because they're saying, you know, we're, we're getting so upset over this one little post. Well, in that same rhetoric about free speech and all of that stuff, we then took it upon ourselves with our free will, free speech to then not affiliate anymore and do our own activities and do our own stuff for our community, because that's just what aligns with our beliefs. And that's what we decided to do with our speech. And so we didn't do some tantrum. I think that's that's ridiculous to call it that. Um, and those that's that's not what it was at all. We we saw something that was insensitive to community, our community and we responded appropriately and responded very peacefully and responded very professionally. And that's what we did. Erica, would the response be different if the university made a post of, say, students visiting Katanji Brown Jackson? So if Katanji Brown Jackson, Justice Katanji Brown Jackson, invited, say, the Empowering Women of Color, the organization that you're the president of, if she invited your group, your board, your leadership team to the, uh, you know, to the Supreme Court and took a picture and the school, the law school posted that picture would you be sensitive to, you know, the Federalist Society members on campus if they said, well, wait a minute, that picture is offensive to us because we oppose Katanji Brown Jackson? So is the question like, how would I feel if they said that? Yes. I mean, we're talking about parody here, right? And that's what some of the, the critique has been is that you guys, you guys being the students that have protested, want the school to take action with respect to this photograph with these students and Justice Kavanaugh. But if you were visiting Justice Katanji Brown Jackson and there was a beautiful photo and mm -hmm. the school posted that, would those Federalist Society students have the right to protest that photograph? Yeah, I mean, obviously they have the right to do whatever they want under the First Amendment. So I don't really have an issue with them doing that. I think though that frequently this is framed as like a parody of, I don't really think it's a parody to say that Katanji Brown Jackson and Justice Kavanaugh are like on the same, you know, it's just a matter of like a difference in politics. Um, I think that there's so much more wrapped up in what Brett Kavanaugh has not only like done towards women, but also what he now stands for as kind of this like frankly, like emblem of fascism, like in our country. But I think that the Federalist Society has the right to call out whatever they want and use their right to free speech for sure. Goddard, some folks called Justice Kavanaugh a rapist. And obviously folks had a, a very visceral response to that. Do you think that was a bridge too far? Um, and the response or what they called him? What they called him, some of the students that were protesting the photograph said that they were upset because Kavanaugh is a racist. I mean, a rapist with a P, not a C. <laughs> Maybe a C too, uh, but <laughs> in this case, it was a P. I mean, I think that speaks to how strongly people felt when they saw that photo. And given, you know, we all saw the testimonies, we all saw the evidence, and it, it's really not about politics there. It's about what the evidence showed and what people believe to be true. And so I think it's valid that a lot of people called him that and called, you know, and said these things because that that's what their beliefs are and that's what those allegations were. And that's why it was information that was very triggering. And so I think that's why I agree with Erica that 
if it were a different justice who doesn't a photo of them does not cause that harm then it's not the same thing then you know they're free to protest if they could find a reason to i'm sure they could but i think that's why it's more about that that visceral reaction is because of that, that those allegations and that history of what he's done yeah, when we come forward, I want to talk about, you know, beyond the protests, the actions that some of the affinity student groups have taken in terms of their relationship with the school, particularly around recruiting diverse students. Stay with us, KBLA Talk 1580. Black women making history at the Oscars. Maisha Cairo here with your K Black Minute News brought to you by Lendistry. The 95th Annual Academy Awards took place this week. Although the show has Black media critics in an uproar, due to Angela Bassett not winning Best Supporting Actress, we still celebrate costume designer Ruth E. Carter for becoming the first Black woman to win two Oscars. Carter has worked on astounding films in the past, such as Selma, Malcolm X, and Spike Lee's School Days. Carter's moment has come again as she has won her second Oscar for Best Costume Design in the Marvel sequel, Black Panther, Wakanda forever. After taking home her win, Carter says she hopes that this can create more opportunities for other women of color in film. I'm Aisha Cairo, and that's your K-Black Minute News. Next to our new sponsor, Lendistry. Lendistry is a national Black-led small business lender that is headquartered in Los Angeles. Lendistry helps small business owners access the affordable capital needed to grow. Visit Lendistry, L-E-N-D-I-S-T-R-Y dot com forward slash K-B-L-A today. I can't wait for what's next. Even with higher stroke risk due to atrial fibrillation and a regular heartbeat not caused by a heart valve problem. Eliquis, a fix of ant tablets, reduces stroke risk. It's the number one cardiologist prescribed blood thinner. Don't stop taking prescription Eliquis without talking to your doctor, as this may increase your risk of stroke. Eliquis can cause serious and in rare cases fatal bleeding. Don't take Eliquis if you have an artificial heart valve, abnormal bleeding, or have antiphospholipid syndrome. While taking, you may bruise more easily or take longer for bleeding to stop. A spinal injection while on Eliquis increases risk of blood clots, which may cause paralysis, the inability to move. Get medical help right away for unexpected bleeding or unusual bruising, or if you have tingling, numbness, or muscle weakness. It may increase your bleeding risk if you take medicines such as aspirin products, NSAIDs, SSRIs, SNRIs, and blood thinners. Tell your doctor about all planned medical or dental procedures. Learn more at Eliquis.com or call 1-855-ELIQUIS. KBLA Talk 1580 celebrates women's history, spotlighting women in our community who are creating positive change. This KBLA Women's Leader Series, sponsored by Walmart, spotlights Molly Bell. Please meet Molly Bell. Molly Bell is a community activist and prayer warrior. Straight out of Compton, Molly Bell's activism and dedication to service and community has gained her recognition as an honorary member of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated. Molly Bell exemplifies one who is worthy of the KBLA Women's Leader Series sponsored by Walmart. KBLA and Walmart salutes Molly Bell. This KBLA Women's Leader Series sponsored by Walmart spotlights Gabrielle Earl. Gabrielle has taken part in developing and establishing the Black Family Circle Parent Advisory Committee for the ABC School District. Gabrielle was a disaster service worker during the pandemic, helping support the unhoused. Gabrielle is an employee for the City of Los Angeles, Port of LA, as a warfinger. Gabrielle was awarded the LABP I'm joined with uh, by Goddard Solomon, VP of the Latin X Law Students Association, and Erica Lopez, President of Empowering Women of Color, both affinity organizations at Columbia Law School. And Goddard, so in addition to being upset, voicing your concerns about this post by the law school, you guys had an opportunity, or some of the students had an opportunity to meet with the administration about its con about your concerns. What was the response from the university? Uh, I think the response was a lot of, we hear you, we see you, um, and and we'll get back to you on some stuff. I think that that was kind of the way to sum it up. I, I think they, they understand our concerns, and I do think there will be things done to address a lot of the student leadership concerns, because like I, like I mentioned before, 
affinity group leaders just aren't given the support that we should be given, you know, a, a lack of academic credit, lack of any stipends for our orgs, you know, having to do all the work on our own. Um, it's it's a lot in addition to being in law school students, which as I'm sure you know is a lot. And so it's it's it was a lot of work and I think they're gonna they're gonna take action to remedy that a bit. But when it came But did to they the take post, the post uh, down? They did not. And so when it came to the post, the post was not going to come down. And their stance was that it, it they had to essentially grapple with erasing um, those individuals who are in the photo versus, you know, the harm that it did to the hundreds of people who interacted with the social media posts and said that this was inappropriate for the school to post. So they ended up going with, you know, with the individuals from FedSoc. So, Erica, I know in addition to having a meeting with the uh, administration at the law school, Affinity groups have decided not to participate in recruiting efforts uh, that the university engages in as it relates to bringing new students onto the campus. What does that look like? And is that doing more harm to those prospective students uh, than it is to the administration? So the way that it's looked like is this week, for example, was admitted students programming at Columbia and um, none of the affinity groups in their official capacity were participating in any of those recruitment events. But we did have our own um, separate events in the evening that we put on with our own money, because this is like another reminder that the school doesn't give us any money to do anything, but they always expect us to participate in recruitment activities, even though all of our funding is coming from our own fundraising efforts that we do with law firms. So we just decided to use our own money to put on our own event. And that way we didn't have to feel like we're kind of being censored by the administration in terms of what we're allowed to discuss. So I don't necessarily think that the students of color and like other marginalized students didn't have an opportunity to, to speak to us because we did put on our own separate events. I think this is just more of trying to really get the administration to understand that without us, they're not able to do the kind of diversity recruiting that they claim that they want to do. Is there a time frame? Is there like, you know, school respond to our request to A, B, C, and D, and then we will you know, start back working with you on these recruitment efforts? You know, is there something, some triggering date that will, or triggering activity or response from the school that you're waiting for? So we came up with a list of demands that we presented during that meeting with Dean Lester. And then from there, we didn't really get, as Goddard said, like there was some indication that they're interested in trying to do certain things. But we didn't, I personally didn't feel like I walked away from that meeting with like any sense of urgency around it. So there is no timeline. There is no deadline quite yet. Now, as affinity groups, we're sort of continuing to iron out our demands and sort of plan what the next steps are. But as of now, there's no return to participation. Goddard, if I'm a prospective law student and I come to one of these events that Columbia sponsors, and since the affinity groups aren't working with the university, who's going to be at that event? Who am I going to meet as a prospective law student? Uh, you're likely going to meet other individuals from the law school, and there may be it may be a more a less diverse student, perhaps, because all the affinity groups are withdrawing, and most of our members, you know, stood in solidarity and withdrew as well. But I think. You know, it's important for those admitted students to see that because we couldn't in good conscience and good faith continue to participate in these admission activities and get recognition from the school only during the admissions week just because we do all this work. And then to put on that facade and say, everything's okay, please come to Columbia, we're amazing. And meanwhile, our school is not supporting us at all. Do and you then worry though, let me ask you this, God, hold a second. Do you worry though that if I'm a prospective student, I'm like, oh, they got a lot of mess going on, a lot of drama at this law school. I think I'm going to go over to, uh, you know, NYU or Harvard or Stanford. Yeah, I mean, I guess the folks that are, you know, getting into Columbia or getting into those other top law schools as well. Do you worry that students may say, yeah, you know, I kind of see their point, but I don't want to come into a school that has this kind of tension between the administration and its affinity groups? Well, I think that's exactly what the admissions department and like the, the administration at Columbia needs to see. 
is that our admissions recruiting events are what get a lot of diverse students to come to this campus. And that's not me saying that because I'm a leader of one of these affinity groups. That's me saying that because I was that individual one time. And I've heard all the individuals that are currently coming to the school say that same thing once they get here. Hey, that, you know, event that Lulsa, Balsa, Ewok, and all these other affinity groups did, that event was amazing. And that's what sold me on Columbia. And we're still doing those events. We're doing them separately. And so students still get to have that experience. But now they have more of an authentic experience where they know, okay, I'm going to have a community that supports me here. And they're passionate about me. And they're going to keep it real with me all the time. But I also know what I'm getting into. And I also know that like this is not just a Columbia thing. This is happening, at, as you mentioned at the very beginning, at many elite institutions and many law schools in general. Um, but we're not going to hide that from you. But we are going to always continue supporting you. Erica, and finally, uh, what's been the response from some of those students that went to the uh, Supreme Court and took that picture with Justice Kavanaugh? Have they weighed in on this conversation in any way? You know, what are they saying about this controversy? So... I have only heard one student who actually is a student of color who I'm not sure if she's actually in the photo, but she is in FedSoc. She has been very, very upset about um, the backlash from the photo and of FedSoc's sort of indictment as she sees it. Um, but I don't know. And FedSoc, you're meaning the Federalist Society. Yes. Yes. Okay. But I don't so she's know. She's upset saying it's not fair. Is that her position that this isn't yeah. fair? Yeah. She thinks it's not fair. Um, and I guess my response to that is if like, if this isn't fair, then like what would fairness look like? Because the vast majority of your peers feel harmed by this. So is that something you take seriously or not? Have you got or have you heard from any of those students? Do you know what their reaction has been? Has it been similar to what Erica has heard? Um, I think similar. I honestly haven't had a one-on-one -on -one conversation directly with anybody in that photo. Um, and so, so I don't want to put words into anyone's mouth, but I think the sentiment that I've heard around the law school is something similar, you know, kind of similar to some of the ridiculous rhetoric that some of the articles have started saying, you know, if this is fair, if this is, you know, us throwing a tantrum, like all those things that are kind of just, once again, like Erica said, like, well, then what about, you know, the hundreds of people who said they're harmed by this, the incoming students who said they're alarmed by this, the alumni who said they're harmed by this and just really concerned. Is that equity? Is that, is that equal? I, I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's, if that's what the message is supposed to be, but it doesn't seem like, you know, and that's also our communities, like I said, our affinity groups are often having to deal with something, you know, putting out a statement because of something concerning that happened, you know, in the world, in the country, on campus, et cetera. And I'm hard pressed to find a recent time where that community, federal society was putting out a statement because they were so harmed on this campus. And so I, I don't know. I don't I don't know if that fairness argument is really is really capturing the reality of what's going on on that campus. Well, I want to thank both of you, one, for coming on, having the courage to you know, speak about this openly and to take this fight up with the administration. And things like this do matter. And hopefully the university will get the message that this photograph was harmful to people and will take some actions to provide greater support to the affinity groups that have been so intimately involved in helping the university. Unfortunately, a lot of universities, a lot of institutions talk about diversity, but they don't want to do the work of diversity, which is uh, giving voice and you know taking action with respect when diverse people say that they are harmed by certain actions. So what a learning opportunity for this university. Let's hope they get the right message. Again, thanks to Erica. Thanks to Goddard. This is it for Reva Martin in real time. I'll be back here on Tuesday. Uh, Avi Bernard will be holding it down on Friday and Monday. Follow me on all social media platforms at Reva Martin. And the next voice you will hear is Robin Ayers at the Raw Report. Stay with us, KBLA Talk 1580.